Will you bow your heads with me before we begin? Gracious Father in heaven, I ask that your spirit would guide us this morning. As we look at one of the prophecies in Ezekiel, help us to see the way that it affects our lives today. Touch my heart, touch my lips, let my words be from you, and let our hearts be willing to receive the gifts that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. Our scripture reading comes from verses 11 through 14, and I'll just read those before we begin. Ezekiel chapter 37, 11 through 14. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. The prophet Ezekiel spent a lot of years predicting Israel's demise. It wasn't a a job that he enjoyed doing. It wasn't a message that the people enjoyed hearing. They didn't like to hear that foreign armies, an enemy was going to come and capture them and carry them away from home to a foreign land. And the first half of the book of Ezekiel is filled with those kinds of prophecies of doom. Those prophecies eventually did come to pass. Babylon came and conquered Israel, took the people away from home, and Ezekiel had to go along with them, which we could build a whole sermon just out of that idea. Here's faithful Ezekiel, prophet of God, has to go into captivity along with the rest of them, but we won't go there today. Uh, But once that happened, the messages that were coming from God through Ezekiel took on an entirely different tone. The second half of the book of Ezekiel sounds a lot different than the first half of the book of Ezekiel, and I like to call them the hang-in-there prophecies. God told his people in the second half of Ezekiel to have courage, to bear up under their trials, because those very difficulties that they were facing were the very things that were going to change their hearts and bring them back to God. He shared with them how he was going to change their situation, how their relationship was going to be restored. And God gave his people glimpses of the brilliant future, the glorious future that he had in store for them once the discipline ran its course. The difficult warning passages that the Bible prophets give were not just for ancient Israel, they're for us as well. But that also means that the hang in there prophecies are also meant for us. Even today, we still have to bear up under the trials, the suffering, the discipline that comes from our Father who loves us enough to discipline us. Because he loves us so much, he doesn't want to lose us. So if there's no other way, he's willing to allow us to suffer in order that he might draw us back to him so that he won't lose us. Now, it's not him that is making the suffering. He's allowing difficult things to come through us. When Satan heaps difficult and hurtful things upon us, we need to understand that God doesn't waste those times. He doesn't bring them on, but he doesn't waste them either. They're far too valuable in getting our attention. 
and helping us to comprehend what's really important in life. When we fall victim to Satan's evil deeds, God does not leave us out there to fend for ourselves. It's during those difficult times that the hang in their prophecies can be so encouraging to us. Today we're going to look at one of those encouraging prophecies where God says to his people essentially, hang in there, I am near, and I'm going to change everything for you as soon as you recognize the danger in the life choices that you've been making. This prophecy is probably one of the most famous of all Ezekiel's prophecies, and here's what happened in verse 1 of chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of dry bones. Now, this was in vision. Uh, God didn't take Ezekiel there physically because by this time, Ezekiel was in Babylon along with the rest of the exiles. The valley where God took him in vision was the Valley of Topheth. I don't know if you've ever read about the Valley of Topheth in your Bible, but the Valley of Topheth was where the Israel, as they were following foreign false gods, began to sacrifice their own children to these gods. And of all of the horrific practices in which they participated, one gets the feeling that this one made God the most angry, <laughs> which I can understand. That makes me angry, just the very thought of it. This valley was full of bones. It, this, we're talking in symbols here. This wasn't the bones of the children necessarily, as we'll find out later. And there weren't just a few of them. There were many bones, maybe even piled high. Uh, verse 2, He led me back and forth among them, the bones. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Build, go ahead and just build the picture in your mind. God takes Ezekiel to this valley full of dry bones. He allows him to roam around, to explore, to see what's there. Ezekiel notes the great number of bones, and he notes that they are not fresh bones. They're, they're bleached, dried, brittle. Life has been gone from these bones for an awfully long time. And God allows all of this to sink into to Ezekiel's psyche. And then he asks him a question in verse 3. He asked me, son of man, can the, bo these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord. So that's what Ezekiel was supposed to say. Okay, Ezekiel was used to this. He was a prophet of God, and God often gave him messages to present. He was usually presenting them to people, not dry bones, but okay. So I imagine him maybe even climbing on top of a pile of dry bones and yelling and, and, and shouting this prophecy out to, to the bones. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you, cover you with skin and so on. And then verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there came a noise, a, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Maybe Ezekiel wasn't standing on a pile of bones, because if he was, he'd have to find another spot quick, right? A clear spot, maybe a rock to stand on, because suddenly the bones began to move. The, the, the whole valley began to rattle together and the ankle bone connected to the foot bone. You know the story, right? <laughs> and the leg bone connected to the ankle bone. Uh, I looked, verse 8, and the tendons and the flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Ezekiel actually got to watch this recreation. I mean, imagine it, envision it. He saw the bones come together and then he saw 
the organs grow inside the rib cage. I mean, talk about a, an A and P lesson, anatomy and physiology, right? Uh, then he saw the muscles and the tendons attach and grow onto the bones, and then he saw skin be pulled over the bones. And where there had been stacks of bones, now there were stacks of bodies looking better than they had before, but they were still lifeless. They were still stacks of bodies. At creation, God made man, right? He formed him from the dust of the ground, carefully. And then when he was done, there lay a body. But it was still lifeless. Until when? Until he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So stand among all the lifeless bodies. Ezekiel shouts this prophecy across the valley. Verse 11, then... Um, Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. The Israelite captives, captives in Babylon were, were mourning their situation, understandably so. God has abandoned us, they felt like. We have no hope, we're as good as dead. But what they didn't recognize was that they were misreading the, the situation. The whole terrible scenario, God had worked into his plans. He didn't cause it, but he allowed it because he could make it work for the eternal good of his people. His people couldn't see it, but God was at work. These trials and their suffering, God knew, was the best thing that could happen to them. God wasn't punishing them in a punitive way so much as he was disciplining them, training them, purifying them. God wasn't lashing out in anger. He wasn't completely abandoning him. What he was doing was he was conscripting into his service the pain that Satan was causing so that he could work changes in his people. He was commandeering the evil that Satan intended to do and he was working it for good. He just needed his people to hang in there while the suffering did its work in them. Verse 12. Therefore, prophesy and say to them this is what the sovereign lord says O oh my people i am going to open your graves and bring you up from them i will bring you back to the land of israel i will bring you back to the land of israel i'm going to restore you then you my people will know that i am the lord when i open your graves and i bring you up from them i will put my spirit in you and you will live and i will settle you in your own land then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. So God informed his people time and time again. The entire problem was that they no longer knew him. Then you will know, because they didn't before, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. And when the Bible speaks of knowing, the Bible is speaking of relationship. That's what, it, that's what it's talking about. They had stopped living their lives with God, and they were living alone, so to speak. Remember when God created man? He said it is not good for man to be alone, and so he created Eve for Adam. How much more when we live apart from God would God say that it's not good for man to live alone? We were designed to live in relationship with God and know that he is 
God, if we want to live, really live, and not be dry bones, if we want to live, we must live in relationship with God. Without Him, we are nothing but dry, brittle bones. You can understand what's going on here. This, what we're seeing in the parable, I mean, in the prophecy, is a parable. It's not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. In reading the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you will quickly come to realize that most often when the Bible is talking about death in the New Testament, it's talking about spiritual death more than physical death. To be physically dead, it's not a very big deal. Why? Because simply God says a word and we Rise to life again, correct? But to be spiritually dead is an entirely different thing because we get to choose whether or not we live. And God will not force someone to live spiritually. We get to make that decision. In Ezekiel's vision, the house of Israel, the ones receiving this message, they were physically alive. They were in exile in Babylon. They were physically alive. But the reason that they were in exile in Babylon was because they were spiritually dead. Their relationship with God had been neglected until it had all but vanished, and they were, spiritually speaking, dry, brittle bones. And because of this choice they had made to, to die spiritually, they were suffering, and they felt that they had no hope of ever being restored, which, in a way, is kind of the way that we ought to feel when we come to face to face with the reality of the way that we've lived our lives so far. We ought to wonder, <laughs> how is this going to change? How is this going to fit? We, we, we may do the minimum requirements. We may be at church every week. We may be, pay the 10% tithe that God requires. But ancient Israel was doing that as well. At the same time that they were sacrificing their children. Our problem today is the same as their problem back then. We don't know our God. We don't live in close relationship with Him. We know the proper words to say, concerning relationship, but the reality is that most of us are pretty clueless about what this whole business of relationship is all about. It's pretty jargon, it's meaningless words, but we don't know God the way that we need to know Him. We're all in the same boat, every one of us. If we knew God, we wouldn't have the division, the disunity, the anger, the resentment, the bickering. Those things are clear evidence in our lives, spiritually speaking, that we are dry, brittle bones. We're captives in a faraway land to our character weaknesses that we can't control. We feel empty, we feel anxious, maybe angry, maybe helpless. We feel like we have no hope. And as a result of our choices, we suffer. We're stressed, we're diseased, we destroy our health. We struggle financially with our marriages, with our children. And we don't even recognize that God is using our suffering to work some changes in us. According to Revelation 3.19, though, those whom God loves, He disciplines, right? And it's entirely possible that that's what happens, is happening in our situation. God has tried other ways to get our attention, but when those don't work, He is willing to do something more drastic because He is not willing to let us go. 2 Corinthians admonishes us, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. That's what we feel like sometimes, isn't it? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, that's what he calls them, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What he's saying is, hang in there. Hang in there. God's discipline comes with promise. He can make our dry bones, the dry bones of our spiritual lives, come together, come back to life. He can put flesh on it. He can make it real, and then He will breathe into us the spiritual life, His breath, His spirit, and we will once again become living souls. Remember, the, dry, the bones were very dry, very brittle. Life was long gone for them. They had been dead an awfully long time. And yet God brings them to life just as easily as he brought the dirt to life at creation. Just as easily. We're not too far gone. 
there is hope. The fact that we're at church doesn't make us spiritually alive. The, way, the fact that we call ourselves Christian, that doesn't make us spiritually alive. Only one thing makes a person spiritually alive, and that is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ, where you abide in him and he abides in you. But we kind of throw those words around kind of easily, don't we? What does it mean to abide in someone and someone to abide in you? How does that work? How do you have a relationship with somebody that you cannot see? I think we make it too complicated. We think that because God is, is God, he's different than, than other human beings in ways of relationship. But that's not exactly true. We were created in God's image, right? The same way that we maintain a relationship with another person, we maintain a relationship with God. God is a person, a divine person to be sure, but a person nonetheless. We were created in his image. When we're apart from each other, when I'm apart from my wife, we like to have a relationship continue, right? That's why we call on the telephone. That's why we think about each other. That's why we try to, to do things that please each other. That's the way of relationship. That's what we do when we're, when we're in love. Since God is a person and he created us for love and that kind of a relationship, it works the same way with him. We can think about each other even when we can't see each other. We can talk to each other. It's called prayer, right? We can live in that kind of relationship, thinking to please each other. It's actually pretty easy when you're motivated by love. And since God already loves us this way, all that's needed is our response. We have to return the love. And that is when the dry bones come to life. The question is, is can we do it? Can we love God that way? Not on our own, we can't, no. But Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel's vision, who brought the, the dry bones to life? Did the bones do it? No. The power of God did it. Uh, Romans 5.5 5 says that he pours, I like that picture, he pours his love into our hearts through his Holy Spirit. He pours it into us. Like everything else, our relationship with God is a gift from God. So what do you think? Do you want to live in that kind of relationship? Are we, are we tired of being dry bones spiritually? We can be resurrected to new life. It will require some discipline because God knows we need it. But he says, hang in there. Hang in there because I am about to bring your dry bones back to life. All you have to do is accept that free gift. Say, yes, Lord, that's what I want. And then in response, in our loyalty and our obedience, he does the work in you. He fills out the dry bones with flesh and skin and feelings and emotions and love. It's all up to God. We only need to respond.